Hi everyone, so we're going to continue in this chapter reviewing some of the concepts that you learn in your introductory chemistry class. Here we're going to talk about how we quantify uncertainties in measurements. As I discussed in the previous video, there are uh, different types of precisions associated with the instruments you're using, and the different level of precisions are then going to introduce some type of an error to your measurements. Now, there's two different types of errors that you can see. The first one is something we call a systematic error. And a systematic error is basically an error that comes because your instrument is not properly calibrated or properly set up the, the way it should be used. So for example, if you look at a bathroom scale, if there's nothing on it, it should have the number zero on it. But right now, if we look more carefully at the scale, it actually doesn't start at zero. In fact, it starts a little bit off from zero. So in fact, it starts, if you want, uh, at a negative number in this case. So if someone were to step on this, their weight is going to be off by that number, the difference between zero and where the needle actually starts from. And so that's an important idea to keep in mind because when we use any instruments, we want to make sure that it is properly calibrated. And if it's not, then all the readings made by that instrument is going to have the same value of error. So like in this particular case, let's say that number happens to be five pounds. So everybody who steps on the scale is going to be lighter by five pounds. And that's the reason why it's called systematic because it's the same exact value every time. All you need to do to fix this problem is calibrate the instrument. And you want to calibrate against some kind of a standard. So you want to make sure that you uh, put something that says that's the zero point right there. Now, the way we know that an error is a systematic error is by measuring the accuracy of a measurement. So accuracy is a measure of how close the measurement you make compared to another reference value or a measurement that's either made by somebody else or something that's already published as the measurement of this quantity. So for example, just to go back to the scale, let's say you measure your weight here on the scale and you see the number 150 pounds. So you go to your doctor's office and the doctor's office shows 155 pounds. Now we know that there's a difference in accuracy because the measurement that you have is not the same as the measurement you have in your doctor's office. And it could be a problem with your scale, it could be a problem with the doctor's scale. Now, if the doctor's office says that their scale has been calibrated correctly, then the problem is then with your scale. And what we can do then is we can calculate something called a percent error in accuracy, which is given by this formula. TV here stands for true value, which is the value you're comparing your measurement to. So that's your reference value. So for your doctor's scale, would be the true value. The experimental value is the value that you yourself measure, in this case the value coming from your scale. You take the difference of those two and you express that as a percentage, as a ratio to the true value. So you take the difference of those two. These symbols right here represent um, absolute value, which means that whether you get a negative or a positive number, all you need to do is get the value itself, divide by the true value, and multiply that by 100% to get a percentage value. Now, random errors is a second type of error. There's no specific source of that error. The error is, in other words, not constant, unlike the systematic error. And the reason why this happens happens is because there's some type of unpredictability in the environment or the way things work for that particular instrument or the person who's doing the experiment that causes these errors to sometimes show up and sometimes doesn't show up. So an, a real common example is what we refer to as electronic noise in electrical instrument. If your wire is kind of old, for example, movement of those electrons is not going to be uniform. So sometimes there might be more electrons flowing, sometimes there might be less. Static noise, when you're trying to listen to a radio or you're trying to get a cell phone signal, that's actually a really good example of random error because the error really is associated with the environment you're in. So if there's a lot of wind, for example, maybe you're going to have more of a problem getting a good signal versus when there's no wind or if there's rain, etc., etc. Now, the source of that error is not constant. And that's the reason why it's really hard for us to narrow it down. The, the only way we can fix this random error is by making repeat repeated measurements. So the key word here is repeated because these errors is not the same every time. If we repeat our measurement again and again and again and again, and then 
and we average it out, all these errors would get canceled out because sometimes the error makes the numbers go bigger, sometimes the error makes the number go smaller. And so this is a process we call smoothing the data, which is basically just to average out all the errors, leaving us with the actual signal that we're supposed to get. Now, if your data really have random errors, then that data would have what we call a normal distribution. Okay, the word normal here has a very specific meaning. It's a, a type of distribution where it looks like this. A lot of times you might have heard it called the bell curve. If you make repeated measurement, let's say you measure your data, you make that measurement a hundred times you're going to find that this middle value right here that's marked as zero is your average value. So when you average it out, you're going to get a certain number. So 34% of the time that measurement is going to be different from the average by this quantity called one sigma. We'll talk more about that in a second. And then 34% of the time, it's going to be, the measurement's going to be bigger uh, from the average by that quantity one sigma. So in total, there's 68% of the data that's going to be plus or minus one sigma from the average. And then if you go further to two sigmas, then that's going to cover even a larger percentage of the values right here. So roughly about 95% of the data should be within plus minus two sigma from the average. But let's talk a little bit about how to calculate an average. So there's two different ways you can calculate an average, right? So the average that's shown right here in this bell curve. So the first type of average is what we call arithmetic average. Uh, and the way you calculate this average is the symbol of it is uh, x bar is just the sum of all the individual values of x that you have divided by the total number of measurement. Now, a second type of average that's not as commonly used in the sciences is something called the median. The way you get this is you just take the middle number of a set of data points that have been numerically ordered. So in other words, you make it go from the smallest number to the largest number, and then you just pick the middle number of that series. This is particularly good if you don't have a lot of data points. When you don't have a lot of data points, what happens is sometimes one of the data points could be really big or really small. These are what we call outliers, and that's going to really affect the calculation of the mean. But if you use median, those outliers are not going to affect the value of the median as much. However, if you have a really large data set, 1000 data points, for example, then the two values mean and median should give you fairly close measurements. Now we're going to get to the third quantity, which is called standard deviation. That's what that sigma was earlier when I was showing you in that plot. So what is standard deviation? Standard deviation is a scatter or spread of your data around the average. So what's that mean? In trying to quantify our random error, we make repeated measurements. It's possible that when we repeated the measurement, measurement again and again and again, that it's fairly close together. So you can see that for this particular distribution, it's still a bell curve, but the bell curve is very narrow. When the bell curve is very narrow, what that means is that most of your measurements is pretty close to the average. So this is what we refer to as a small standard deviation type of measurement. And this is a pretty good data. It has very high precision because all the measurements are close together. This one is what we would refer to as a fairly a low quality measurement because the there's a large standard deviation meaning that the data points are spread all over a large range going from all the way from here all the way to there the average here being the middle number there right so the data could be either highly precise or not very precise and what you do is you calculate this quantity called the standard deviation which has that symbol sigma that helps you figure out what kind of data you have so how do you calculate sigma or standard deviation you use this form formula right here. And the formula basically says you take the difference between each of your data point from your average. So this x here is really should be x bar, uh, which is the mean. Okay. And so you take the value of the mean, subtract from each value of the data points you have, square that, and then you add all of those squared differences. And then at the end, divide that by n minus one, and then take a square root. What you get out of that is your standard deviation. I'm going to show you a quick example on how to 
to calculate standard deviation using the formulas that we just talked about. The question here says calculate the standard deviation from the following measurements and gives you three different numbers. So imagine you've made multiple measurements of the same mass in this case and you get different numbers and you're trying to figure out what is the scatter of this measurement, how precise is your measurement. So the first thing you have to do is you have to calculate the mean or your arithmetic average, which is just done using the formula that I had given you earlier, take all the measurements, add them up together, and then divide by the total number of trials you have, which is three in this case. So doing that is going to give you 2.35 grams as the mean. Now, once you have that, then you can use that standard deviation formula to actually calculate the standard deviation. So the way you set this up is you take each of your measurements, so 2.36 uh, and then 2.34 and 2.35, and for each measurement, you're going to subtract the mean. Now remember, the mean is 2.35, so we're going to subtract from 2.35 for each measurement, and then afterwards, we're going to square that difference. So this is the difference between the mean and the individual measurement, then we square it, okay? So we do that for all three measurements, as you can see in the numerator there, right? And once you do that, you're going to divide that by the total number of trials minus one, so three minus one in this case. And then once you have that, you take the square root, that's the last step of calculating your standard deviation, take the square root, and then find out what that answer is. In this case, the answer happens to be 0 0.01 grams, and so that's your uh, standard deviation. Now, one of the things that's really important to remember is that the number of decimals of your standard deviation must match the one for the mean. So in the case for this example, your mean has two digits after a decimal, so it's 0.35, right? So those are the two different digits there. So your standard deviation, if it, for example, if you get 0.0, zero one two three four six seven grams your final answer for the standard deviation is still going to be 0 0.01 grams because you have to have two digits after a decimal point just the same as you have for the mean the other thing to remember is that the standard deviation like the mean must have a unit a lot of times people forget to include that unit but that needs to be part of your answer the standard deviation by itself is not that meaningful you might think that well if i have a small number in my standard deviation then that means i have a distribution that looks like this and then if I have a large one that means I have distribution like this that's not always the case because the standard deviation by itself is just a number that number could be big, could be small, but it is not meaningful until you compare the standard deviation to the mean. So remember that when we draw these pictures, we always have the mean there. We always show where the mean is. And then once we show the mean, we can see that this is a bad standard deviation, whereas this one is a good one because it's closer to the mean. This one is further away from the mean. So if you wanna be able to determine how precise your data is, you would actually calculate something called the percent error in precision, which which is done by taking the standard deviation, which is this number right here, and then divide that by the mean and then multiply by 100%. That's what actually tells you the precision of your data. So if this error is large, that means your data is not very precise. If you were to plot your data, it's gonna look something like this. Whereas if this number is small, that means you're gonna have something that looks like this, which is a high precision data, okay? Precision is really one of the more important things that you wanna report every time you do any kind of measurement in the sciences. So the way we do that is we write the mean value plus minus one standard deviation. Now here's the key part that a lot of times I see students forget. The number that's written here, the mean and the standard deviation must have the same number of digits after the decimal point. Notice it's not the significant figures, but it's the number of digits after a decimal point. The reason why it's the digits after a decimal point and not significant figure is because what you're doing here is you're doing a plus minus or addition subtraction operation it's not multiplication division so what you're keeping track of is the number of digits after a decimal point the other thing that people often do in reporting results for scientific measurements is they also show plots where there's a mean that's marked on the data and then there is a bar that shows the plus minus one standard deviation from the mean so 
Here's an example. This is a very common way of what you'll see in scientific articles. So here what this data is saying is that the mean is right here. And but then this person made multiple measurements. So that line represents one standard deviation from the mean. This number right here is clearly more precise because standard deviation is much smaller compared to this standard deviation. So that tells you the quality of the data. People also write numbers, actual numbers. So in this case, you can see that the height here is measured as 162 that's the average and then plus minus 11 which is the standard deviation so in that sample of 47 people the average height is 162 centimeter plus minus 11 as the standard deviation but you notice that both of them ends at one's place right they don't have the same significant figures but they do have the same number of digits after a decimal point